we are coming up to the time of year that we re revisit a most memorable time in history. Jesus Christ went to the cross to be our lamb sacrifice to pay for our sins and the sins of all of mankind. Then in three days he was raised from the dead and he rose in glory to the right hand of the Father. What actually happened during this time in history as it relates to us? Well, we were redeemed and we were reconciled at the very same time. Let's look at those realities a little more closely today. When God created us in the Garden of Eden, he was very pleased with his handiwork, as he mentions in Genesis 1.31. We were made perfect and God wanted an everlasting relationship with us. But something went terribly wrong. Adam sinned against God by eating from the tree in the middle of the garden, and then out of guilt and shame he ran from God's presence. Let's read about that in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, beginning in verse 6, Genesis 3 and verse 6, When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Now, it says later in the New Testament that Eve was deceived at this point, but Adam knew exactly what he was doing, and he sinned. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. Now they were ashamed, whereas before they were not. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, because that's what they normally did with God. They walked hand in hand with God, and especially in the cool of the day. But this time they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God, God called to the man, Where are you? Because again, they had this very close relationship before sin entered into the picture. In verse 10, he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid. So now fear enters into the relationship, which of course, of course busts the relationship apart and destroys it. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, well, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? So God immediately knew what had happened. The man said, well, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. So then the blame game starts and there's no reconciliation in that. Verse 13, then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And that was the truth. So here... God gives to Adam and Eve the answer to their sin problem in verse 14. He's going to give the answer to sin. The answer to sin is him sending through the offspring of Eve, the Son of God, Jesus, so that he could pay for the sins of the world. And in verse 15, he says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head, talking to Satan and you will strike his heel. In other words, he would die on the cross. But then he would be resurrected, and we would all have what Jesus could only give us, redemption of sin, redemption from sin, and reconciliation with God in relationship for eternity. Well, notice what God does here before he asks them not to come to the Garden of Eden anymore. In verse 21 he says, or it says here that the Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. So even though they had sinned and broken the relationship, God knew that they couldn't continually walk around in fig leaves. And he made them garments. In other words, he made garments that were suitable for wearing. Probably they were already tanned and ready for wearing. The animals that were in the garden, some of them were used to make clothing for Adam and Eve. Because God loved them unconditionally. And that's what we have to always know about who God is. God has unconditional love for you and me. But this was the way that man would respond to God. They would feel that God was trying to punish them, and then they would try to hide from him. And mankind has been doing that ever since. With God not in the picture, with Jesus then not in the picture, we feel God is all about punishment and we don't see the relationship that is everlasting 
that God has given to us through Jesus. The people of God down through time have had one quality along with their faith in God. They did not fear God because they did not fear being punished. You stop and think of King David, how he loved God. And now God loved him. He had no fear that he was going to be punished. He knew that God's mercy was greater than anything he could imagine. See, the people of God always know that God loves them. Because that's the truth. That is what God does. He loves all of his people. Even those who do not receive him, he loves them too. There's a prophecy in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, which was fulfilled when Jesus died on the cross for our sins, and he rose from the dead in glory. And it talks about how God was going to give Israel a new heart and write the covenant of his law on our hearts. And that would be for eternity. He's going to give us a new heart. And his writing the law would be writing the law of love. That would be written on our hearts, and it would be for eternity and that was a prophecy that God gave through Jeremiah. And that reality was spoken of again in Hebrews 10, starting in verse 11, 11 through 18. Let's look at what it says there in Hebrews 10, because that was the verification that Jeremiah 31 was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10 and verse 11. Day after day, every priest stands and performs... His religious duties, again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when the priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Of course, referring to Jesus Christ, who was fulfilling the office of Melchizedek, the high priest. Since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool, because by one sacrifice he is made perfect forever, those who are being made holy, and were made holy through Jesus. He forgives our sins, and his righteousness is attributed to us, and then he reconciles us back to the Father, to the Holy Spirit, and to himself for eternity. In verse 15, the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. This is the Holy Spirit speaking now. This is after the resurrection of Jesus, many years after. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord, quoting from Jeremiah 31. I will put my laws in their hearts, the laws of love, the two laws, love toward God, love toward man, and I will write them on their minds, which he does through the Holy Spirit. In verse 17, then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. See, now there's no need to fear being punished. There's no need to fear shame because that's all been taken away. God does not remember our sins anymore. We believe in Jesus, but that's all taken away. And where these have been forgiven, there is no longer any sacrifice for sin. Yea, see, Jesus dying on the cross took care of the sin problem forever. The past sins, the present sins, and the future sins. There was only one sacrifice needed, and Jesus made it. But also, what happened on the cross, of course, is that we were reconciled. The relationship that had been broken in the garden by Adam's sin now has been restored. We now have a relationship like God gave us in the garden, which was very intimate, very personal, and very true. So when Jesus redeemed us on the cross, he took away the penalty of the law. There's no longer any condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Let's notice what Paul says over in Romans, the 8th chapter. Romans, the 8th chapter, beginning in verse 1. Romans 8, in verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life, set me free from the law of sin and death. No condemnation. It's amazing how we act when we don't feel condemned. When we know that we're free, free of sin and the penalty of sin, well, we are now free to love, free to have a positive view of other people. It gives us time and energy to focus on 
restoring relationships and making good on promises that we make to one another. So that's an important thing in our human psyche and in our spiritual man and woman. In verse 3, For what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. In other words, the, the prodigy of Eve, from her line, Jesus was born. Born of Mary and Joseph, but Mary was the mother, the Holy Spirit, who is the one who gave her the pregnancy of Jesus. What a wonderful thing that we have come to know that Jesus was the promise given in Genesis, that from Eve, her line would give the answer to the sin that Adam, her husband, was a part of back in the garden. And so he condemns sin and sinful men. In order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the Spirit. And of course, we receive the Holy Spirit when we believe in Jesus, because that gives us that close relationship. Then we walk in the Spirit, we live in the Spirit, we communicate in the Spirit, and we are one with God. So now we are the children of God forever, with full rights of inheritance. It says that down later in the same chapter of Romans, Romans 8, beginning in verse 15. Romans 8 and verse 15. For you do not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. See, fear has been taken away by the love of God shown to us and in us now because we believe that Jesus is the answer to our sin issue and to our relationship issue. But you receive the spirit of sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. With great endearment we cried to God, Abba, Father. The most endearing of terms. In verse 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. In other words, we'll walk in the footsteps of Jesus. And we'll encounter people who are in pain and give them the answer to help them come out of the pain they're in by believing in Jesus and receiving what he's done on the cross and be a part of the relationship that is now forever, for eternity. Jesus' victory over sin and death at the cross also reconciled mankind with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as I've mentioned. Let's go and look at it, though, in 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 11. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11. Talking about the ministry of reconciliation. Since then we know what it is to fear the Lord. Yes, we've all experienced that, one way or the other. We try to persuade men. What, are, what we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, referring to himself and his ministry, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather that, than in what is in the heart. If we are out of our mind, in other words, if we're crazy for God in our thankfulness to Jesus, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you and your benefit. In verse 14, For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So, redemption. Redemption was given to us completely and totally. Verse 16, so from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. We have a different perspective. We have a spiritual point of view because we're now in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do know so longer. 
we do so no longer. We don't do it that way anymore. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Any believer today is a new creation. Every, every time we reconsider this, we're new. We're renewed in our spirit. The old is gone, the new has come. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. He has reconciled us so that the ministry of reconciliation can go on from this moment for eternity. It's a relationship that lasts for eternity. So that's why, even though the redemption has been taken care of, redemption from sin, the reconciliation, once we receive it, goes on for eternity. It's called into heaven, new heavens and new earth. That ministry has been given to you and me. To anyone who believes in Jesus, that Jesus came and redeemed us by dying on the cross and rose from the dead to live forever but at the right hand of the Father. To all those who believe that, we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us, us believers, the message of reconciliation and all of those who will become believers because of our testimony. In verse 20, we are therefore Christ ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. And no matter what kind of job we do for our normal income, taking care of our families, being good citizens of the community. We are God's ambassadors first because we are believers in Jesus. We are Christ ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah that God gave us the answer to sin and the answer to a broken relationship with God. We are now forgiven. The righteousness of Jesus has been imputed to us and we are reconciled and now we will be with Jesus, the Father, the Holy Spirit forever. And we see that relationship very clearly expressed by Jesus himself in John 17 and verse 20. John 17 and verse 20. Very, very meaningful, very important words to remember because these are the words that Jesus said just before he went to the cross. John 17 and verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's your message and mine, the disciples of Jesus, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. So just like the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one, so we are to be one as well, through the same Spirit, in the same way, which is hard for us to understand until we walk in it and express it one to another. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. And that is the key issue. See that from the foundations of the world, back in Genesis, God said, I will send my son Jesus. In verse 22, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. Now that's really being reconciled, that kind of oneness. But that's what Jesus does in our living when we believe in him. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That's what the world needs to know. The world needs to know that the Father sent Jesus and I have loved them, us, all of us, even as you have loved me. That's what the world needs to know. We need to know no other political persuasions or opinions. We need to know that. That is life-changing. 
that is eternity in its description. That is called heaven. That is what Jesus died and rose again to proclaim to us. So Jesus wants us to proclaim it to others. That they will know. That those who do not know will know because of our testimony. So let us rejoice that what we are about to celebrate is truly wonderful. It's wonderful news. We have been redeemed from our sins and we have been re reconciled back to God as his beloved children forever. Would you please join me in prayer? Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. This day of looking forward to the death and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's now a point of history. It's happened almost 2,000 years ago. A lot of time has gone by. But your truth remains. And your truth remains that you love us unconditionally. And you've redeemed us from the sin issue, from the problem of sin, which was death. You've forgiven us. You've given us your mercy. The righteousness of your Son, Jesus Christ, has been attributed to each one of us. We ask and pray, dear God, therefore, that we'll just be so thankful that you have redeemed us from sin and from punishment and from shame. And we ask and pray, therefore, that we'll now know that we have also been reconciled to your Son, Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ. And he has reconciled us to you, Father, and to the Holy Spirit. And in your oneness, then, we are one, all believers, because we have the same Spirit. You've given us of the Holy Spirit to indwell us so that you live in us. So we ask and pray that you will help us to be the ministers of your reconciliation, that which will last for eternity, the relationship with you that will last forever and ever. We're so thankful to be counted as your children. And we ask and pray, dear God, that you will bless us in that wonderful understanding and the reality of that relationship that we have with you today through Jesus Christ. So it's in his holy and his precious name that we pray and ask these things. And we say, Amen.